Let's move into the 1920s, the birth of the modern woman. The 20s was the jazz age. It was a wild party, but kind of a sad one, too. The world was in shock after uh, the First World War, and so the 20s was all about drawing a line in the sand, starting again, and living fast. It was also the time of prohibition, when organized crime was on the rise with bootleggers and rum runners. Jazz, jazz music was all the rage, this crazy music that nobody had ever heard the likes of before. It was the time of the great Gatsby, of course, and women won the right to vote. And they certainly dressed as if they had earned that right to vote. Fashion was so exciting and new and different. It was a crazy time when the world, and particularly women, embraced the 20th century and just what it meant to be modern. Let's look at the 1920s body ideal. There she is, short, not skinny, but squat, kind of flat-chested, no waist, a boxy torso with emphasis at the hip. And again, you see the symbiotic relationship between the perfect body and the fashion ideal. Who had this tiny little square squat body? She did. She's called Clara Bow, and she was a big silent movie star of the 1920s. And she really has that ideal little square body. This was the ideal in the 20s. You may have heard that uh, or, or, or believe for some reason that skinny was the ideal 20s body. It wasn't. Flat chested was the ideal, but not skinny. There we go. Bust 34 inches, waist 26 and a half inches, hips 37 inches, blah, blah, blah. You can see it's kind of a, uh, like a, a small, not exactly chubby, but sort of nicely, uh, Nicely built, little lady, like Miss Washington here. And just to prove it, men wouldn't look at me when I was skinny, but since I gained 10 pounds this new easy way, I have all the dates I want. So I hope that's dispelled the idea that the ideal body in the 20s was some sort of tall, skinny, gangling girl. It wasn't at all. It was this very unusual, squat, square little shape. The 1920s beauty ideal was also uh, perhaps a little bit different in reality to what you may imagine it to have been based on contemporary magazine editorials that, you know, channel the 1920s. The cosmetic industry took off in the 20s and makes the beauty ideals in this decade and all subsequent decades achievable. So let's start with our fresh-faced friend again. First of all, she would have to make her skin quite a bit paler with powder. And then, oddly, these very short, quite thin, and down-sloping eyebrows, completely different to our, our contemporary eyebrow aesthetic, which is all about having a, a tall, high arch. No, everything was sloping downwards on the 20s face. Very dark eye makeup, again, sloping downwards to give you the effect that you were tired and you'd been out all night partying. Rouge was also sloping down on the face. And then, weirdly, these tiny little lips. Um, fashionable women would put lipstick only on the front part of their lips, and it was called the bee sting or bee stung lip, like your lips had been stung by a bee at the front and had swollen up. And it's when we put a 1920s bobbed hairdo on this face that you really see this was the 20s aesthetic. Here's our girl again, just to remind you of the power of makeup and how makeup is always used to achieve an ideal. And then 
look how close what we created is to the look of the 20s. Look how downward her eyebrows are. Look how tiny her mouth is. And here again, oh my goodness, those eyebrows sloping down so far. And here, this is a cosmetic ad. Um, Bring us out your eyes. There we go. Uh, but you can see that slopey look. Very odd. I really think it was to kind of evoke this sort of fatigue. You had been out dancing with Charleston and drinking champagne all night, and it was all just so terribly boring. And here is the 20s makeup aesthetic and beauty aesthetic reproduced in contemporary editorials like here which I love. The green fingernails uh, have a meaning but you will have to take cultural connections to fashion with me to find out why green nails were used in this particular fashion layout. And here is another and here is another. This is extraordinary isn't it? And another and look Look at the lips in this last image I've shown you. This is very, very close to what the 20s lip was actually like. And this is the era when women took the plunge and cut off their hair. This is silent movie star Mary Pickford, who was famous in the previous decade for her beautiful long ringlets. And even she, famously, for publicity as much as anything else, bobbed her hair. Here are some more images of girls in the 20s with bobbed hair. Actually, the, the, this last girl here uh, with the bobbed hair on the left, that's sort of the hairdo I have at the moment. But again, note how her makeup and her eyebrows evoke this downward slope. Before going into the dominant fashion idea, this time we really have to look at the dominant aesthetic because the aesthetic would inform the dominant fashion idea so hugely in the 20s that I figure we should do it first. It is called Art Deco, and I am sure you have heard this expression before. Art Deco, it, is, it means Art Decorativ, shortened. Art Deco, and it was about geometry. It was the absolute opposite to Art Nouveau, which was all about organic shapes and sinuous, curvilinear lines, wasn't it? No, forget all that. Art Deco hated that. It was about geometry. It was about straight lines. It was about industry. It was about modernity. And it informed everything, like architecture. Take a look at this. That's not Art Nouveau, is it? It's all about geometry, straight lines. So stylish and stylized. Here it is played out in um, commercial art. Look how stylized this is. In furniture. Oh my goodness, this is not Art Nouveau. This is Art Deco. Look at uh, the way that table is constructed. Art Deco was the dominant aesthetic of the Roaring Twenties in every single element, from furniture to graphic art to even fontage and typography. And architecture, the Empire State Building and the Chrysler Building and Rockefeller Center are all examples of Art Deco. And of course, this would inform fashion. Here are some... 1920s fashion images and articles obviously inspired by this Art Deco aesthetic. It's gorgeous, isn't it? And here is Art Deco on the runway today. You can recognize Art Deco now, right? It's kind of hard to get wrong and it's sort of impossible to confuse with Art Nouveau. There's no straight lines in Art Nouveau. There's hardly any curvy ones in Art Deco. Now we can turn to the dominant fashion idea. And here it is. A snug cloche hat to minimize head size. It was all about having this tiny little head. 
shift dresses. Fully bare arms. Now, we haven't seen this since ancient Greece. A drop waist. This kind of shift dress with uh, uh, a very low waistline. It's really on the hips. It's called a drop waist. Hemline to knees or mid-calf, depending on how daring one was. And visible legs for the first time ever, actually. Wow. 20s fashion, as you can see, completely echoed the Art Deco aesthetic. It was all about geometry and straight lines. And it threw away all old ideas in the wake of World War I and embraced modernity with these clean lines and a geometric common sense. Female fashion also spoke directly to the new woman, a woman who could vote, work, party, and enjoy life in the 20th century. You can jump in and out of a car in a dress like this, can't you? And here is the dominant fashion idea. Some street pictures of real people. And look, each and every one of them is adhering to this aesthetic of the little cloche hat, the drop waist, the bare legs. And here it is on the runway. And I love this last image. But you can see this, uh, this aesthetic was not about looking feminine, was it? First of all, had a very uh, streamlined silhouette, very flat chested, no waist, no curves, no curves. Curves were old fashioned and this was a modern woman. So were they trying to look boyish? I think so. And of course, this leads us nicely to flappers. But before we even begin to discuss flappers, please be aware that there were very few real flappers in the 20s. The phenomenon of the 20s flapper was amplified and exaggerated during the deco revival of the 1970s, which we'll learn about next week. Most women in the 1920s were certainly not flappers. Yet the handful of genuine flappers was something else. They were outrageous. They were shocking, they were daring, they were loud, they were obnoxious. And uh, they showed more than a little leg, I can tell you. Now, why were they called flappers? Well, the general belief is that they earned this moniker based on the unbuckled galoshes, you know, the boots they wore with uh, the buckles unfastened so the tongue of their boot would flap as they walk and make a noise. This is false. I believe that this was so, but it was when I was doing very in-depth research for this course that I learnt that I had been wrong, along with uh, most of the rest of the world. The term flapper dates back to as early as the 1890s, remember? The gay 90s? Likening modern young women to baby birds, flapping their wings as they learn to fly. Well, now that you know all about the 1890s and, ooh, electricity and Coca-Cola and roller skates, you can kind of see that this term probably comes from the 1890s um, with these uh, young women wanting to sort of uh, uh, encapsulate the, the spirit of the 1890s uh, by doing exciting things like riding bicycles and drinking Coca-Cola. Uh, so, yeah, you know what? I actually think that, that it makes more sense coming from the 1890s. Um, yet, far from roller skating and drinking Coca-Cola in leg and mutton sleeve blouses, uh, flappers of the 20s, true flappers, were sort of out fooling around with guys snorting cocaine, getting wasted. They were a very different breed. But you know what? Even in the 20s, people thought the word flapper came from the galoshes. So, you know, this is how confusing history gets. But really, it was their galoshes and their footwear and their very short skirts that caused sensation. I love this article so much. January 29th, 1922, the New York Times. Great piece of alliteration here. Flappers flaunt fads in footwear. 
Unbuckled galoshes flop around their legs and winter sport shoes emphasise their feet. Subheading. Stocking scare dogs. <laughs> this is hilarious. You, when you go back and review, see if you can read this article. It, it's, you know, people acting shocked and appalled at flappers. Kind of the similar articles appeared in the 1970s with the first wave of punk rockers on the streets of London. But as I said, the real flappers, woo, they really were outrageous. They even did things like smoke in public. You know, it was against the law for women to smoke in public prior to the 1920s. So flappers, they sure embraced this uh, unhealthy new trend. In fact, you could take classes to learn how to smoke. And now you go to hypnotherapists to try to stop smoking. Yet flapper or not, for the first time in history, women showed their legs. And the hosiery business would boom as a consequence. Now remember, uh, stockings weren't made of nylon in this era. They were made um, of cotton or silk, right? Or wool in the winter. Uh, but everybody wore stockings. And so novelty stockings really took off because people could show their legs. I think she must be the cutest girl we've looked at so far in this lecture. But really, this idea of regular people showing their legs, regular women showing their legs, was revolutionary. I mean, imagine if you were uh, 50 in, 19, in the 20s, you had been a young woman wearing a bustle, right? Imagine how you would feel showing your legs for the first time, just being able to walk and move and breathe. If you look at the photo on the... Uh, Right here, I love this picture. Uh, so often when you get uh, snapshots from the 20s of real women, they are always crossing their legs or doing something interesting with their legs. This is so leg-centric, isn't it, this picture? They've all made sure that they're showing off their legs because it was such a novelty to show off your legs. The silhouette was all about streamlining. How was this achieved? With something called a bando. This was kind of like a bra that sort of flattened your boobs out a bit, but kept them supported and uh, sort of solid under your shift dress. And then you would wear stays. Uh, like this, we've met the stays before. These were not uncomfortable. They just kept, they just kept you geometric. They kept that torso firm and smooth. Like this, which meant when you got dressed, everything would be perfect. Everything would be smooth and geometric. And add a long string of beads, which we associate with the era, and like a long boa over your shoulder. And you'll see that hats and accessories helped streamline the elongated silhouette, right? It was all about having this silhouette. And here it is in real life. She looks adorable, doesn't she? And again, terribly chic. Wouldn't you love that dress now? And again. But please note the skirt length. Most hemlines of the 20s fell just below the knee or to mid-calf. Only the very daring and those flappers we were discussing wore skirts that actually hit the knee or went above the knee. Let's look at the 1920s palette. We see a lot of crimson and scarlet, a lot of gold, interesting blues, Egyptian blues, black, yellow. It was bold, it was dramatic, it was confident. It was really picked up from what Paul Poiré started in the previous decade. And meet metallic for the very first time. This was a rage, a craze, a freak of the 1920s. Metallics, uh, sequins, bugle beads, paillettes. You know what paillettes are, right? Uh, paillettes are like big sequins and they don't have the little buckles on them usually. They're, they're flat, big flat sequins. All of this 
shimmering, shimmering stuff was really new and exciting and different. Hats. We already discussed the reason the hats were so small was to keep the heads small and also to reject the idea of those big silly cartwheel hats of the earlier decades of the pre-war era. These hats, I know you know they are called cloche hats, but you know what a cloche is. Cloche is the French word for bell, and you can see why they are called cloche hats, because they sort of have a bell-like shape. Here is an ad in a catalogue for um, cloche hats. Now you can buy hats for all your outfits. I love that. Look at all these different cloche hats. Yet, even though they have different details and slightly different widths and slightly different brims, they are all the same shape. And everybody wore them. This is one of the world's first selfies. It's a photo booth picture. And look at this girl taking pictures of herself. She knows she looks cute in her cloche hat. Babies wore cloche hats. Older people wore cloche hats. Everyone wore cloche hats. That's such a funny picture on so many levels. And I love this image. Every single lady there is wearing a cloche hat. It wasn't just for flappers. I know that you've probably been, you know, uh, uh, given the impression that anyone who dressed like this and wore a shift dress with a drop waistline and a cloche hat, they were a flapper. No! Another aspect of 1920s headwear were these decorative headbands or fancy scarves. Why do you think headbands and scarves were so popular in the 20s? And no, it wasn't just stop people's bobs from getting in their eyes when they were dancing the Charleston or nonsense like that. Why do you think headbands were so popular? I'll give you a second to think about it. I'm going to put my um, Jeopardy thinking music on for you again while you're thinking. All right, enough time. Women were so used to having hairdos and hair, and there is not much you can do with bobbed hair. If it's too short, you can't wear it up at all. It's very limiting. Let me tell you, I have a bob. And there's nothing I can do with it apart from have a bob. So this was a way of adding interest to hair. That was too short, too style and quaff. Time for our style icon of the 20s. And somebody who's one of my personal favourites. This lady here. Her name was Louise Brooks. And she was a silent movie star. And she was a flapper. She always played naughty girls. And uh, I'm just showing you a little clip of her here, this little gif. She was extraordinarily pretty and luminescent and charismatic and absolutely had a look that everybody wanted to imitate. And there she is, acting very naughty but looking very cute. And she was extremely trendy as well, extremely fashionable, but at the cutting edge of fashion. Which is why so many people channel Louise Brooks. That's Halle Berry channeling Louise Brooks. Can you guess who this is? This is Julia Roberts channeling Louise Brooks. But nobody beats the real Louise Brooks. She lived to be a very old lady. She became a writer. She was very smart. Um, and here is a great quote. A well-dressed woman, even though her purse is painfully empty, can conquer the world. We know that's true, don't we? Anyway, fashion loves Louise Brooks, so I wanted you to be aware of her existence and see if you can catch a movie with Louise Brooks. She really is spectacular. The designer of the decade, I think you know who I'm going to talk about, right? This lady here. Gabrielle Coco Chanel. Chanel. If anyone understood that fashion is not an island, it's a response, it was Chanel. 
And there she is wearing one of her own creations. She believed clothing should be comfortable, practical, that women should work in it, travel in it, have adventures in it. She revolutionized the understanding of clothing, that you could be fashionable and minimal at the same time. You could be fashionable and comfortable at the same time. Hell, you could be fashionable and go to work and hold down a job at the same time. This was really at the heart of Chanel's intent. And of course, she gave us the little black dress, didn't she? And there it is, the original little black dress. Do you want to learn how she came up with the, the idea for it? Then I shall tell you the legend of the little black dress according to Chanel. This is Chanel's maid. Evidently, she looked at her maid one day, and this is how French maids traditionally dress, uh, or did in this era. And she thought, wow, that would be a great dress for me to go to a cocktail party in. We'd have to lose, you know, the baguette and the lacy cuffs and the collar and the apron and the little maid's cap. Swap up that hair for a chic cloche. Add a string of pearls. Maybe a boa. Twenties makeup. A glass of champagne and, of course, the accessory of the era, a cigarette. And there you have it. That is the look that marked the twenties. And there it is, the little black dress. It is without doubt that Coco Chanel was one of the most brilliant designers who ever lived. She really did understand better than anyone else. Fashion is not an island. And she responded with clothing that worked perfectly for a new woman in a new century. She did it in the 20s, and you will see she will do it again in the 50s. Yet although she was a brilliant fashion designer, she was a crappy human being. Here is a book that discusses her crappiness. Sleeping with the Enemy, Coco Chanel, Nazi Agent. During World War II, when France was occupied by Germany, by Hitler, Whereas most French were uh, patriotic to France, Coco Chanel literally slept with the enemy. She had a boyfriend who was uh, one of uh, the high ups in the Gestapo. She evidently uh, worked sort of as a Nazi agent, uh, sort of grassing on uh, French people, etc., on her countrymen. And she really wasn't a very nice person at all. So it always kind of sticks in my throat when I have to gush about Chanel. Um, but she was a great designer, and we will leave it at that. And with this quote, Fashion is not simply a matter of clothes. Fashion is in the air, born upon the wind. One intuits it. It is in the sky and on the road. Basically, it's not an island. It's a response. Right, enough of her for the time being. Fellas were having fun with fashion too. Take a look at that. There was a craze to wear plus fours, you know, golfing pants. Here are some fellas in their sweaters, v-neck sweaters, that they were a, a 20s craze with plus fours. And this was the most ridiculously trendy fad of all. These are called Oxford bags. Oxford bags. Because evidently the, the young students at Oxford University in England were the first one to wear these outrageously, outrageously uh, massive trousers. Look at the hem. This is a publicity shot, obviously. Somebody measuring this outrageous hem. Take a look at this fella in his Oxford bags. There was also a craze for raccoon coats, especially amongst students. The favourite of college men, Gunther Raccoon Coats, being sold on Fifth Avenue. It's the headquarters for raccoon coats. This is how much of a craze it was. People were billing themselves as the raccoon coat headquarter. 
20s male fashion is so much fun. If you'd like to learn more about it, take menswear. Three credit professional elective with Professor Cockle. And talking about guys brings us nicely to our next style icon of the 1920s. This man, Rudolf Valentino. Rudolf Valentino was a silent movie star. He was really the world's first male sex icon. He was a sex symbol. He was known as the Latin lover and women loved him for his brooding looks. He always played very exotic roles like Arabian sheiks and things like that. Uh, as you can see here. But he really was a sex symbol. How Valentino obtained his marvelous physique, and there he is showing off his marvelous physique. He was also a very natty dresser. People imitated him. Men wanted to dress like Valentino. So he was really one of the first men as well in the 20th century that other men wanted to look like. Remember seeing that cute girl? Well, here's a colorized picture of her. Remember when we were talking about um, the, the craze for novelty stockings? Well, look who's on her stockings. Rudolf Valentino. Rudolf Valentino sadly died at a tragically young age of uh, an infection in the abdomen and uh, it caused mass hysteria when he died. Take a look here. This is his uh, funeral parlor. Look at all of those people, those fans wanting to be near the body of Rudolf Valentino. But I can't help but notice, look how many uh, Bola hats are in that image. I think a lot of his fans may have been men, actually, judging from this. And um, I'm sure you know what I'm implying here, right? I am beginning to look more and more like my miserable imitators. That is our quote from Rudolf Valentino. Like I said, people really did want to dress like him. And now we're going to look at our first cultural hotspot of the 20th century. A cultural hotspot, as I mentioned earlier, is a place, a location that just seizes the imagination of everybody and has an impact on fashion. And in the 20s, it was Egypt. Why? Because in 1922, this guy, Howard Carter, discovered the tomb of Tutankhamun. But hey, You've already learned all about the 1920s Egyptian craze when we did Ancient Egypt. You remember, we talked about how uh, everybody went completely nuts for Ancient Egypt in the 1920s. So we've done it already. But just to remind you, look at this. Forsyth, the new Egyptian effect. Exemplified in a lovely Forsyth gown. There we go. And what about this? Uh... The decorative splendor of the Tutankhamun period reflected in this rich embroidery of this wraparound coat. And here's an image I don't think I showed you before of a beautiful drop waist evening dress with an Egyptian motif. And look at the embroidery on these 1920s evening gloves. And on the hem and sleeves of this coat, you see, this is what I mean by cultural hotspot. Another style icon of the era that I have to talk to you about is this lady. Do you know who she is? She's called Josephine Baker. And she was a dancer, singer, and an entertainer who came up with the Harlem Renaissance of the 1920s. She was exotic. She was funny. She was charismatic. She often danced bare-breasted, wearing sort of incredible uh, costumes with lots of feathers, etc. She was also very, very smart. Here she is in her famous and iconic banana skirt. This is what I mean about exotic. And what I mean about being smart is that she realized that for her career to go to the heights she wanted it to soar to, she couldn't do it in America. Why? Think about it. In the 1920s, America was still 
horribly segregated and terribly racist. So, Josephine Baker moved to France, which is why the French sort of claim her as their own, Josephine Baker. They claim her as their own and she became the absolute smash hit of Paris. Uh, working in nightclubs like Maxime's, being on the whole sort of uh, fashionable celebrity circuit. She was the first African-American uh, person, not just woman, to headline in a movie, to star in a movie. It was a French movie, Les Sirènes des Tropiques, The Siren of the Tropics. She was also an incredible businesswoman. She was one of the first celebrities to franchise and market her name. She had a product that she put her name to called Baker Fix. This is an advertising uh, model for Baker Fix. It was a ha hair uh, pomade. It was a hair gel, basically. And she earned a lot of money. She endorsed everything, everything from shampoo to cigarettes to cars. She worked hard, but she was business savvy, and she made a lot of money, enough money to buy Chanel. And here is a beautiful picture of Josephine Baker in a Chanel uh, dress. She looks amazing. Unlike Chanel, when World War II broke out and Germany occupied France, instead of being a traitor, Josephine, who was American, she wasn't even French, became a spy for the French resistance. And there she is. She was a, a soldier of the French Free Army and she was a spy and was incredibly brave. Because to be a spy in occupied France during the war, your punishment, no trial, you were just instantly shot dead. So she was incredibly brave, which is why the French awarded her the Légion d'Honneur, the Legion of Honour, which is the highest honour that the French can bestow to a civilian. If that wasn't cool and great and awesome enough, a little later in life, she became part of the American Civil Rights Movement. There she is. She came back to America to fight for civil rights. She also used her wealth to adopt, I don't know how many, 12 children from all over the world, little unwanted children, in orphanages. She went around and adopted them, and she called them her rainbow family. So well before Angelina Jolie started doing this, Josephine Baker was doing this. So it is quite fitting and good and proper that there's actually a, a, a place, you know, a little neighborhood in France, in Paris, named in her honour in the 14th arrondissement, arrondissement, I speak French, so sometimes I accidentally, you know, speak French, plus Josephine Baker, 1906 to 1975, I'll translate it, musical artist, a uh, uh, sub-lieutenant in the Free French Forces and philanthropist. No wonder everybody always likes to pay homage to her. This is Diana Ross doing Josephine Baker in the 70s. This is Beyonce doing Josephine Baker. And fashion loves Josephine Baker. And goes back to her iconic look time and time again. So I wanted you to be aware of who she was. And you know what? She is such a cool and inspiring woman. It's always a joy to talk about Josephine Baker. Well, the jazz age might be over, but its spirit lives on because fashion and fashion editors and fashion photographers and stylists are perpetually in love with it. Here are just a few images that speak to the era that we've just been discussing. It was an era that started with a roar, but ended with a crash, quite literally. On October 24th, 1929, Wall Street crashed and the world and fashion would change overnight.